you so much. Um, I feel like I've had a little bit of heaven this morning, if I'm honest, because you know when we're told in Revelation and those pictures of what heaven is going to be like and different voices, different accents, different languages. This is my first ever experience of being in North Wales. Um, this is my first experience of hearing people sing in Welsh and it was beautiful. Um, so thank you hugely for um, just blessing me this morning and um, just in that worship. And um, yeah, now I realise why my granddad, um, when he was always in male voice choirs, um, when he could still manage that and loved coming to Wales with his male voice choir from Belfast um, to come and visit. Now I understand a little bit more of what he means by that. So it's brilliant to be with you guys this morning. As um, everybody's already introduced me, my name is Jo. Um, I am originally from Northern Ireland. Um, I lived there until I was 18 and left Northern Ireland to go to Scotland as a student. And I have been in Stirling ever since. I'm now married um, with three kids. I've got my eldest, Grace, is 15. She has just sat her first set of exams and done very well. Um, my middle one, Josh, is 13. He's currently playing um, in the Scottish Boys Golf Championship. So I, f I appear a little bit nervous. It's not actually because I'm nervous about being with you guys. It's because I'm a bit nervous as a mum that he's playing in quite a big competition and I'm very far away. He's got day two tomorrow. She could prepare for him as well. And my youngest, Zoe, is 10 and she is a little live wire. She is, yeah, she's just such a little blessing in the way that she just exudes kindness to others. It's been brilliant to travel down um, this last 24 hours and get a little bit more of an understanding of um, what it means to be Welsh, actually. Um, I really feel like I'm going to be able to bring that back to some of our leadership in our organisation as well at TLG. My role with TLG um, started as just being over Scotland. I now bring support to every devolved nation. So Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. I did joke with someone yesterday that I could do with a pilot's license on a private plane. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would make travel easier and quicker. Um, but obviously we don't have that kind of um, budget. But it is really on my heart to be able to share with our English brothers and sisters in TLG what it really looks like in a Welsh context, what it really means to bring um, our programmes, early intervention and make lunch into a Welsh context and what that looks like. So please just know that I'm championing you, I'm cheering you on and I'm just excited to see more um, of what God is going to do in and through you as a church. We're going to think this morning about salt and light. There's some slides should be coming up behind me as well. Um, and the first slide is probably a little bit of an odd picture. Okay, I hope you can see it pretty clearly. It's a diver. And it's a bit of, it's probably not quite as clear as it was on my um, laptop. But on Netflix, a docufilm called The Deepest Breath um, aired probably in the last two weeks on Netflix. It came up on my recommendations list. Um, so I literally dived in. I am one of those people that gets sucked into kind of docufilms. Um, dived into this film, didn't really know much about it, don't know much about free diving at all. Um, and the film is centered around the sport of free diving. And it follows the lives of two prominent athletes in this sport, an Irishman, Stephen Keenan, and an Italian, Alessia Zucchini. Now, a wee disclaimer, okay? If you haven't watched this, and maybe you plan to, I'm going to apologize because I am going to ruin things a little bit for you, okay? Sorry. It won't spoil watching the program. It is based on real events, and the film explores how the lives of Stephen and Alessia became intertwined, how they met on a dive when she was trying to break a world record, how he had used his skills and training techniques as a safety diver to help her achieve her goals, how she then came to dive with him in Egypt, where he'd set up a dive school so she could train to dive through the Blue Hole Arch. And this is having come out the other side of this blue hole arch, this image is from that dive. Like any good film, even a docu-film, there is a love story woven through. <laughs> and Stephen and Alessia's connection went beyond free diving and they fell in love. This image that's behind me remains one of the standout moments for me in that whole docu-film. Obviously because it 
was about free diving, the, the lower that they went, the deeper in the sea, the darker it got. And the sea frightened. I mean, I, lo- I open water swim. Um, normally, Sunday morning at 6 o'clock, I'll be up at our local wet reservoir. My friends have been sending me the pictures from their swim this morning. Um, I'll have to get a swim in um, tomorrow instead. But, and, I've, and I've started swimming in the sea a little bit more this year. But the sea scares me quite a bit simply because of the breadth, the depth, the vastness of it. And in this film, it's really captured in terms of how dark it gets. At this point in the film, in in this image, you can see the kind of juxtaposition between the darkness of the depth underneath and the light as as you're getting closer to the surface. But it's at this point that Stephen is actually sacrificially pushing Alessia towards the light, towards the surface. She actually had become disorientated. He put aside his own safety to ensure hers. And you can probably guess how things ended. He gave his life for her. It mirrors the greatest love story ever told, right? How Jesus gave his life for us. Despite the tragedy of Stephen losing his life in this moment, it's this notion of light and Stephen's pushing, or maybe it's better if we use the word directing, Alessia towards it, that I want us to hold in our mind as we continue this morning. We're going to look at Matthew 5, 13 to 16. I've got both the NIV translation, and we're going to read the, the New Living, the message translation together as well. These are verses that are going to be hugely well known to you, I'm sure. We've probably heard them spoken about so many times before, but I still think there's a message and there's a relevance here for each of us this morning. So it says, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. I've underlined a couple of phrases on um, in verse 13 and in verse 14 where it says, you are. It's not an optional extra. It's who we are. It's who we have been created in him. The message translation reads like this. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste God in this? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there in a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. I love those lines in the message. Be generous. By opening up to others, you'll prompt them and open them up to God. Jesus was speaking at this point during the Sermon on the Mount. And as he would have been speaking these words and saying this, he just finished looking at the Beatitudes and then goes into speaking about the salt being salt and light. These would have been images that people in that congregation at that moment would have been really familiar with. He was telling them, just as he is telling us today, that we are to be people who make things better, and brighter for others. We are to be people who have a positive influence on others. So let's maybe see ourselves this morning as positive change agents. I love a good um, murder mystery or like crime drama. 
And I pride myself now on having watched so many that I can pretty much guess within the first two episodes of a series who's done it. My husband gets hugely frustrated by it. But he now does joke and say, you maybe could have a career at MI5. I think I probably could have. I think I could have been quite a good spy. But let's see ourselves as positive change agents, bringer, bringers of change for others. So in Jesus' day, salt and light were really critical elements to making life more livable, more full, more complete. How we view salt and light today actually might be very different to how those in Jesus' time viewed salt and light. We still view salt as something which can enhance the flavor of a meal because it draws out the, the natural flavor of foods. But we're also conscious in our context of not using too much salt in our diets because it can be problematic. Salt's also useful on our roads during icy conditions, so again, it has a purpose in our modern world. However, in Jesus' time, salt was an essential commodity. In Hebrew society, during both the Old and New Testaments, salt was needed for a variety of reasons. It was a preservative, a seasoning, a disinfectant even used in purification for ceremonial, ceremonial offerings, a unit of exchange. It signified permanence and loyalty. In 2 Chronicles 13.5, it says, Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? Here it's being highlighted that even in ancient Israel, salt was a sign of friendship and loyalty. And just as salt was used as a preservative to make things last longer, when we say covenant of salt, it means that the covenant or the promise is perpetual. It's ongoing. It's not to be broken, just as how salt ensures things last. I'm not sure that's always how I view salt today. Today, we are rightly focused on minimizing our consumption of light energy. We are living in a cost of living crisis, an energy crisis. So we are probably even more conscious of using energy efficient bulbs, turning lights off when we aren't in a room, perhaps constantly, if you're anything like me, we're having to remind your children to turn lights off. <laughs> Light is something that we can access literally at the flick of a switch. It's something that we don't want to overuse anymore. But the crowd at that moment, listening to Jesus speak these words, would have viewed light slightly differently. It was something incredibly precious. It was needed as soon as the sun disappeared. People would have had to use precious fuels to create light. They would not have forgotten to turn them off as the cost would have been too high. Maybe we're learning a little bit more about that in our cost of living crisis. Light gave warmth, security, and allowed for life indoors. So when Jesus used these symbols in his sermon, the people would have realized the significance of what he was saying straight away. They knew that he was telling them that they had to be that present to others, that critical to the world around them. It's still the same for us today. As followers of Jesus, we need to be equally as present to and with others. We need to realize that we're critical to this world, not because God can't step in and do things himself. He can. But because as his people, as his sons and daughters, he says that we are salt and light. He has said to us, this is who I have created you. It's who I've set you free to be. So what does this mean for us today? Well, it means that being salt and light should be absolutely foundational to who we are. Before everything, we should really be thinking, who can I be salt and light to every moment of every day? I'm not sure that's always how I get up out of my bed. <laughs> But in the days when I'm conscious of it, I do very consciously think, okay, God, who are you directing me to today? Who are you prompting me to send a message to? To drop a bunch of flowers off at their door? 
to phone and have a quick conversation with, visit, journey with. There will be people in your street where you live, (laughs) neighbours, who need you to be present as salt and light in their lives. Our desire to be salt and light, to be positive change agents, should flow out of who we are in Christ, his children. I think it's a bit of a kingdom manifesto. I mean, the whole Sermon on the Mount, if we look at it um, in Matthew 5 through chapters 6 and 7 as well, it's the kingdom manifesto. There's some questions on the screen. I don't know if you can see them. I'll read them to you just as we're kind of continuing on this morning. I'd love for you to even take these questions away and just reflect on throughout this week. How can we, how can you be salt and light? How can you be a presence that makes life flavorful for others? How can you be a presence that brings warmth, security, and welcome? How can you be a presence that draws people to seek after the king? What an opportunity in these next two weeks when you're not meeting here together. Could you invite people to come and share breakfast, come and share brunch with you? Maybe the weather would be nice and you could host a picnic. What could you do that could tangibly allow you to be the presence of salt and light for others? Who might God in this next week be particularly directing you to? Mother Teresa has said many incredible inspirational things. (laughs) But one that she said has always really stood out to me was never worry about numbers. Help one person at a time and always start with the person nearest you. The message to be salt and light can seem a little overwhelming. We might feel like the task is too great as there is so much need in the world, so much need in your community, in Wales as a nation, in the UK, and then let's just even go beyond there. We cannot listen to the radio or the news without hearing of more devastation, whether that's in Hawaii today and the island of Maui, whether it's um, people bereaved um, trying to cross the channel to come into the UK. So much devastation and hurt in our world. We can't be salt and light for everyone, but God calls us to be salt and light for the people nearest us. I love that that's what Mother Teresa is encouraging us. Start with the person nearest you. In other words, start with one. We should see this call to action from Jesus as less about us bringing about change in the world in a global context and more about seeing change in our world, the context in which we find ourselves, our part of the bigger picture. And I love that at this church, as a group of people, you are being the light. We have the incredible opportunity this morning to celebrate all that you as Lighthouse Church have done and continue to do to bring light to your community through Make Lunch. Make Lunch, our strap line is to be the light and seek God's heart for struggling children and families in your communities. And that's what you are doing. You are one of 94 churches across the UK making a difference in your local community. Ordinary people with a heart to bring light and see hope restored in a really practical way. So let's celebrate the impact that you have been able to make in the last three years. As a church, you partnered with TLG through Make Lunch in 2019, but it was 2020 when you launched. 2020 has become one of those years that we would all rather forget about, really, isn't it? (laughs) Because you launched under rather unusual and challenging circumstances. COVID threw a massive curveball for everyone and every aspect of life. But even in that challenging time, through Kirsty and through your team, through individuals praying and standing with the team, you supported through Make Lunch, you gave 161 parcels out, which equated to 88 families and 807 portions of food being provided. That's amazing. Fast forward to 2021, And you adopted as a church a hybrid approach. And this allowed you to bring support both in person 
and also through parcel provision. So you held in 2021 three in-person events. And through those events, you served and you supported 163 children and 72 parents or carers. That's amazing. That's people in your community who have been impacted directly by you guys being salt and light. Through parcel provision that year, you ran five parcel provision sessions, which were equated to 59 parcels being delivered to 47 families. And this is the bit that I really love. There were eight children and three parents or carers accessing the wider support of your church as a result of that. Now, those people maybe haven't gone on yet to become Christians themselves, but they are being influenced by Kirsty, by others who are spending time with them. Ultimately, God has got them. He knows where that's going to end up. 2022, last year, saw the first normal, if that's what we can call life post-COVID as normal, <laughs> the new normal, the reset. We knew there were still restrictions across the UK, in Wales, Scotland, there were different restrictions in each of our nations. People themselves felt a degree of maybe greater worry or fear, but you supported families in that season also. You ran six sessions in person with 39 meals provided and 20 children last year and eight parents or carers accessing the wider support of the church. And you also ran a fantastic family fun day, which Kirsty has let me see the video of as well. And what about this year? Well, 2023 is ongoing. But so far, you've managed six sessions. We've still got the rest of summer and October and Christmas to go. That has worked out as 293 children's meals provided. 152 parent and carer meals provided with an incredible 22 children and 14 parents or carers accessing the wider support of this church. As in those words of Mother Teresa, it's not a numbers game, but you've started with one and God's blessing that and God's honoring that through Make Lunch. And I just want to really encourage you to keep going, to keep being salt and light through Make Lunch, keep supporting Kirsty and the team. Because what you're doing is you're bringing support to children and their families in your community. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, once said, I am not waiting for a move of God. I am a move of God. That is definitely the attitude of you as a church. You're bringing salt and light. You're being salt and light in action and bringing change through God, through Make Lunch. Maybe this morning as I've shared a little bit about those statistics and the incredible work and efforts that you are able to be doing as a church, you're maybe a bit inspired. Maybe you've, you're already part of the team. Maybe this is totally new to you and you're hearing this for the first time. I'd really encourage you to speak to Kirsty. Can you get involved? You maybe don't feel that you can physically be there as a volunteer. They need your prayer support. I've got one Make Lunch Club in Aberdeen where the wider congregation, they've just launched this summer, and the wider congregation, many of them didn't feel like they could actually be involved due to their age and, and health. So they set up a little scheme where um, members of the church could sponsor to feed a child, £2.50. Maybe there's a way in which you could help financially. Ask Kirsty. I'm sure sh there's lots of ways in which you could be involved. Albus Dumbledore, the famous wizard from Harry Potter. <laughs> Not so spiritual as William Booth and Mother Teresa. But I do like this Albus Dumbledore quote. Happiness can always be found even in the darkest of times if only one remembers to turn on the light. Times are pretty dark for some people. Each of us have experienced and will experience dark times in our lives. None of us are immune but as God's agents of change, as his positive agents of change in this world, we can turn that light on metaphorically for others. If we are willing to stand with them, journey alongside and get to know them. And through Make Lunch, that's one way in which you're doing that for your community. But I know there are others. You know that there are others. Who in this next week is God going to prompt you about? 
Who still needs you to turn on that light for them? Who needs you to show up to bring out God flavors of this world to them? TLG's vision through our local church partners is big. By 2025, we hope to see 10,000 children and their families supported through local churches like yours. And I want to thank you this morning for being a really significant part of enabling that vision to come to life. And this morning, if you would like to find out more about TLG, find out more about how you can get involved and hear from us as an organization more regularly, please do come and speak to me afterwards. If you were able to support us as a charity financially, that's also something that we can make happen. But most importantly this morning, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone at TLG and the families that you are serving here. A huge thank you. The final slide that I'm going to show just has two images of salt and light on it. And it just says beside it, be both. And just as we close and just as we go into, I think, some worship before we finish, one song maybe before we finish, in that moment, I just want you to think about who is God calling you to be salt and light to this week and beyond? Who has God placed on your mind and you've kind of put it to the back of your mind, as sometimes happens, it sometimes happens to me that God reminds me of someone or something and then the day happens and busyness takes over, and I've got children to ferry from one place to the other, or I get caught up in my own things. But who is it that God has prompted you about? Is there a family that you know need something tangible? I'd really encourage you, just as I close in prayer, as we then go into worship, to just really take a moment to ask God that this morning, to be really open to allow him hitting, to place those names. Maybe even that they're not even maybe neat people that you know. Maybe it's just faces. And God's asking you to be brave, to be bold, to take that step to be salt and light to them. Maybe today, in this next week. Let's just close in prayer. Father, I thank you that you that your words from over two thousand years ago are still as relevant today. That, Father, your vision, your picture of your church bringing hope and transformation comes through us as your sons and daughters. Father, forgive us for the times when we make it more about us and less about you. Father, forgive us for those times when we get so caught up in our own struggles and worries and and to-do lists that we ignore others, Father, that you are prompting us to be salt and light to. And God, I pray that as we move into just one last song as we finish this morning, Father, would you just place the people, the names of people, the pictures of people who we encounter maybe every single day of our lives, But Father, you know they need something more. Father, by your spirit, would you download that to us? Would we be open to hearing that from you? And Father, would you help us into this week and beyond to be your salt and your light to those people? I thank you, God, for the Make Lunch team here. I thank you for the incredible witness and blessing that they have been to their community. God, would you continue to bless that team? Would you continue to, Father, just blow their mind in terms of the impacts and the reach that they are able to have? But God, we know there is more. There's more that's needed. Father, would you rise up more people to be involved? Father, even the building, the space that they need, Father, a permanent venue, God, I just pray that you would go before. You know the prayers that are being prayed. And I ask God that you would answer those prayers in your name. Amen.